Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, sorry there was a bit of a set of technical issues that got me uh, just as I was about to leave my office and it ended up throwing things a little bit for a loop here. Um, so uh, today we're going to be uh, turning a new leaf and uh, examining uh, an important uh, class of models that in fact motivate the use of the methods that we're talking about. In fact, all three methods, system dynamics, agent-based modeling, and discrete event modeling. And uh, this class of systems and of models that characterize these systems are called uh, nonlinearity, are nonlinear systems, okay? Um, and I'm gonna try to, uh, today, focus on a practical example of this nonlinearity um, that will follow us through uh, multiple types of models during the term, multiple types of modeling, and that's uh, drawn from infectious disease. Now, infectious diseases are um, a phenomenon that exhibits nonlinearity, and hence they're going to be our focus, but um, the features that they exhibit are similar to what we see in many different domains. Um, and uh, one of the, the foremost of these features is this process of contagion, um, where you can have um, the evolution of one individual tied in to the evolution of another, either directly or indirectly. Um, so it may be that one individual can transmit pathogen, they can transmit something like influenza to another individual. Um, or it could be that one individual could transmit an idea or some innovation. Maybe they can transmit um, a rumor to another individual. Maybe they can transmit a, um, uh, an awareness of uh, the availability of some, some service or of some product. So we're going to be talking about modeling of contagion here with a particular lens of infectious diseases, but you should realize the basic processes we'll be characterizing carry over to many different domains, okay? Um, now, central to our goals here will be um, emphasizing a feature of these models that, that I've noted, nonlinearity. And the term nonlinear is used in many different ways. Uh, by different parties, and I think it's, it's one of the more overloaded technical uh, terms out there uh, when it comes to popular parlance. Um, we're going to be using the term in a fairly specific mathematical sense. Okay? Um, so the term nonlinearity in a mathematical sense particularly comes up where we have uh, a function. And it, it is performing a, a mapping between a domain to some output range. Okay. So this function may be um, a function, so we say f of x, right? Um, it may be a, a simple function that involves algebra, where we might say, you know, 3 times x. Okay. Now, or it may be a nonlinear function. Um, and I'll just to avoid confusion, I'll write down g of x. This is this is nonlinear. This is linear. Um, equals x squared. Um, and I would argue that um, that each of these has important properties associated with it, which are going to be mirrored in our discussion of these simulation models. Although the link is not immediately clear. So. What are these properties of, of linearity? When we say something is linear, we're talking about a, of all functions that, that go from one domain to a result, a range. Um, linear functions are a small set, but they're a really interesting set. And they're interesting because they're really easy to reason about and because when looked at over a small enough scale, over a small enough time frame or a small enough spatial dimension, a lot of things look linear. A lot of things are approximately linear. So I might draw up a curve here on the board. 
And if I told you, if I were to say this was a linear curve, you would reasonably object. And if it were linear, it would approximate a line. This might be the nearest linear approximation to it or something closer to that. But the point is that the function itself doesn't look, doesn't look linear. But if we were to focus in on very small areas of this, if I were to take a microscope, or even my hand to kind of look in here, for small areas of this, for small, small sort of zones, it's approximately linear. And in fact, much of, of differential calculus, which many of you have taken, that's 110, that's 110. Um, uh, you know, much of, of what we're focused about there is taking derivatives, taking differentials, and they can figure out sort of what the slope is at each of these points. And, you know, one of the early realizations in the calculus coming from both Newton and Leibniz was that we can approximate a function, you know, according to some linear approximations. If we're willing to use many of them over different ranges, will arrive at different linear approximations. So here's different sort of line segments that collectively form a pretty similar approximation to this overall curve. So we end up often taking nonlinear things and trying to reduce them at some level to linear things so that we can be back in familiar territory. Why is it that linear things are so nice? Well, there's a couple features. And these features ultimately boil down to um, the same underlying uh, feature, but um, I'll describe them this way. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, with a linear function, if we consider not just uh, if we consider a, a, an input x, it's actually the sum of of inputs y and z. So, if we characterize kind of the input to the function into pieces, with a linear function, we can just apply that function to each of these pieces independently and sum it up. So this thing here is just substituting in for x, y and z in for x. We have 3 times y plus z, which is equal to 3 of y plus 3 of z, right? And that is simply equal to, how can I write a neat, what is this? It's simply f of y plus what? F of, z. f of z, right? In other words, with a linear function, something that's linear, if we want to understand its response to a given input, in this case, it's a simple number we give it, we can take that input apart into pieces, where the pieces are just added together, and we can apply the function to each of those pieces independently and just sum them up. See what I'm saying? It, it's almost like the, the function commutes with, with plus. You can do the function first or the, the plus first. You see that? You can, you can first add them up and then apply the function to it, or you can apply the function first and then add them up, right? This is kind of a nice feature of, of, of linearity. It's a very nice feature because there are many systems in the world there's many types of functions f where we know, this is a linear function, we know how they operate really nicely on pieces that we can describe. Now, I don't know how many people in the room, I don't know how many people in the room have ever seen Fourier transforms or Laplace transforms. Anyone? Couple? I salute you. Okay, um, that's, that's, that's great. They're a thing of profound beauty. I remember being struck by an undergraduate by the dazzling beauty of it. And um, it, uh, it's one of those times where, probably the first time in my life where with a substantive technical topic, I sort of grokked it and I got closure. So I could forget pieces of it, but I could rederive them from the other things I knew. I could forget exactly how did that work, but I could, I could figure it out. Oh, it's gotta be that from, from the other pieces I knew. And it all fit together with, with amazing beauty. Um, and I treasure it yet. But ladies and gentlemen, with Fourier transforms, 
we're taking a function and we're decomposing it into what? Anyone say? When we're taking a, a Fourier transform of the signal, what are we taking it apart into? So we've got some input we're interested in, we take it apart into what? Into sinusoids? Into to, uh, sines and cosines? We divide it up and, and if we have a linear function, we know exactly what those do to sines and cosines. Um, so we know, we know how the system handles. It's a linear time invariant system. We know how it handles sines and cosines, so we can apply it to each of those pieces, and then we sum up the results and we know how it combines to the whole signal. So if we have some god-awful signal, you know, like, like this, we decompose it into, you know, with lots of curves and so on, we decompose it into sines, like, like this, and then, you know, sum at, at higher frequencies, something like that, and we say how much of each of them are in it, and we know for our function how it responds to each of those of different frequencies for, in, in ways that I'm not gonna have time to go into. And so we can say then how it responds to the entire thing. We just consider how it responds to each piece. And that's beautiful, it's beautiful. We can divide and conquer. We can take apart a complex problem into pieces. Excuse me, we can take apart a problem here into pieces and divide it up and we know how to respond to each of the pieces and we just sum up the result. It's a thing of beauty. And when you can do it, it's a joy forever. But this is a feature, ladies and gentlemen, limited to linear systems, okay? We're gonna see it gets messier when we have nonlinear systems. Okay, let's talk about another feature of this, also on the board. If we have a linear function, and we, if we increase the scale that we give it an input, we give more of that input, we double the input, guess what we get out? Double the function. If we triple the input, we get out Triple the function. So ladies and gentlemen, this is simple. This. We have the function commuting to the multiplication operator. We can do either first. And multiply the input and take the function of it, or we can take the function of the input and multiply it times the scaling factor. So the system responds in an extremely simple way. A linear system responds in an extremely simple way to to our input. We double it, we get more out. And these are nice features of, of, of linear systems. They're beautiful features of linear systems. Um, and they allow us to reason much about the world. And much of technical and applied mathematics um, uses techniques like this to reduce nonlinear things into linear things so we can describe them nicely. And in fact, as any logic is running your differential equations, as it's running the stock and flow models that we'll be building, and the ones that you have been building, that's what it's doing. It's reducing it to a set of linear steps, each of which has known slope, and it will run the form. But guess what, ladies and gentlemen? Guess what? There's a lot of systems in the world where if you come to it on the face of it, they aren't, they aren't, linear, and they're nonlinear, and where these properties are no longer hold, right? Um, where these properties no longer hold. So it is not the case that if we have g of x equals x squared, that if we have g of x of y plus z, this is not equal to, most certainly, g of y, you know, g of uh, y squared plus, excuse me, oh, doing? not equal to g of y plus g of z um, here, because that would imply g of y plus g of z is y squared plus x squared, uh, plus z squared, and there's, that's not the case. This is, you know, if you square this, you don't get that, right? And similarly, if we take g of alpha times x, if we double x, 
we don't get out double the result. What do we get out? Four times the result, right? So this is certainly not equal to alpha times g of x. And that is, because uh, alpha times g of x would suggest uh, alpha times um, times x squared, whereas really it's it's alpha squared x squared. Okay, these are nonlinear systems. Now you may be wondering what in the world does this? So that that all may be good and true, that maybe that's the case. But that's just you know a sideshow. What what does that have to do with simulation models? Well, ladies and gentlemen, it has everything to do with simulation. In many ways, it is the, one of the major motivations for simulation models. Because simulation models are our recourse, our foremost recourse, whether it's integrating differential equations or whether it's solving large sets of agent based models. They're our primary recourse when nonlinearity is involved. But it's not just that. To understand the behavior of those systems is much more complex, and we need the simulation models more. Okay, um, so for linear systems, the whole is is uh, simply the uh, uh, sort of the behavior of the whole is is just can be related to the behavior of the the, the parts. And all the system dynamics models we've examined thus far are linear with respect to state variables. Now you may wonder, you know, what what are we what are we talking about here? Well, for simulation models, the function here. Um, you know, we're going to be considering the inputs to the simulation. We're considering the in initial state of the model. Um, and we may even, in some cases, put in the, the parameters as kind of part of the inputs, although those are often specified sort of just as, as assumptions. And we're talking about the initial state of the model. And the question is, what's the behavior of the model? Or what's the behavior of the system to some initial state? Um, and I would argue that for complex systems, we don't get these nice properties. We don't get these properties here. You know, we have things like diminishing returns. So if we scale up some effort, we don't get, if we double our effort, we don't get double the results. Um, if we consider undertaking two policies together, we often will get quite different results than taking each in isolation. Okay, so we're going to be talking about here nonlinearity in these systems. Um, and it reflects the fact that uh, underneath the, the covers, these systems are a uh, fairly sophisticated series of uh, differential equations. Or when it comes to, to um, agent-based models, we're going to be seeing stochastic uh, systems. Um, and uh, we're going to, on occasion, particularly for these sort of models, dive down into some of the, the linear algebra, calculus, differential equations on which they are based. Um, and we may even make some reference to numerical analysis, to how these, these systems behave when we simulate them in ways that may be sensitive to our assumptions about that simulation, like how finely we integrate them. Okay? There's more complex things that I can't cover in this course, but which are very relevant to other courses. And in general, I can only, I can sort of only uh, uh, touch on, on some of these issues, okay? Um, okay, so uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to now, um, with any logic, I asked you to, to call up any logic, and I will do the same here. Um, uh, I am going to go and create a um, uh, create a model which exhibits nonlinear features, and we are going to use that model to probe some of the unique uh, properties of um, nonlinear systems. Um, they include response to inputs in the form of interventions, in the form of changing the initial state. But it also will include things like tipping points. The system will be very sensitive to, uh, to, to uh, the, the assumptions with the system. And if you change it just a little bit, you may get radically different behavior out. And there will be domains 
where one type of behavior applies and another type of behavior applies, and there may be an ability to nudge the system from one domain to the other. So you can get very different outcomes. The example I use in my software development class, ladies and gentlemen, is one of um, software development teams. Um, take the same team of people, the same technologies, and you put them in different environments, different managers, for example, who respond to unexpected events or challenges or, or pressure from above in different ways. On the one case, that project, that software project, may uh, succeed greatly. It's a stable team. It attracts great talent. Um, team members have been there for a long time, don't have to have a lot of highly burdensome documentation. A lot of it's in their heads. You get great productivity per team member. You get great morale, and you get people really devoted to maintaining the quality of the code base, a lot of pride in what's going on, and happy customers in many cases. Conversely, that same team, under very different management, under management that may be predatory or may, may focus on the symptoms of the situation, being behind schedule instead of asking why are they behind schedule, um, you may end up uh, with a team that literally starts to fall apart. It goes to hell in a handbasket in you know a year or two, where that team is fairly low morale, they lose people all the time, it's hard to get good talent, the code base is confusing and, and under-tested, you have customers that are quite unhappy, and you have a, um, a, a product which is really uh, falling well short of its potential. Um, very different outcomes, and there's different basins of attraction that could lead a team to go from one to the other. Um, these, are, these are examples of kind of different outcomes with different equilibria. So we're going to see systems like this can develop different equilibria. So ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to go to any logic, and I'd like to close all the models that we have. Okay? And we're going to go in, and we're going to create... Uh, an existing uh, a model in this area that will be um, uh, illustrative of these phenomena. And it's a quite simple model, but it's one which uh, has lots of richness to it, lots of um, particulars that are going to provide food for thought. Okay? Uh, okay, so ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, I would like you to do the following. Um, I would like to go and uh, start a new model, new, I was going to say model, and this will be called uh, infectious disease nonlinear model, okay? And the time frame associated with this, ladies and gentlemen, will be, uh, will be, give me just a second, I'm trying to remember if it's days or, days or weeks here. Um, so uh, let's make it, um, okay, let's make it weeks, okay? Um, so per week, yeah, great, okay, there we go. Okay, now um, I would like to go and we're going to start to drag in drag in some stocks, okay? This model is going to be one which exhibits um, some distinctive behaviors, and I'd like to, uh, to put this in place. So one, one of these is gonna be, um, uh, we're gonna drag in a stock called susceptible, okay? Okay, so where do we go for stocks? We go to this system dynamics palette down here under the fluid library and we drag in stocks. Okay. Next, we are going to go to drag in one called infective. Infective.
Okay. Here we go. And next, we're going to add in one called recover. Okay. And actually, before I do this, maybe what I'll do for didactic purposes, let's, let's take out recovered. And we're going to put in, we're going to build this up step by step to just develop some further intuitions. We've seen some system dynamics now, but it's fresh enough. I would like to, um, uh, uh, I would like to go and, uh, and see what if we uh, can build up some additional time. Additional, additional intuitions. So I'd like to add a flow between these two stocks. Okay. Now uh, this flow will be called uh, uh, new infections. And I'll, I'll keep that lowercase, new infections. Okay. Here we go. Great. And ladies and gentlemen, if it didn't connect to there, make sure you drag it over so it connects on both sides. Okay new infections, and we're going to start here um, uh, with uh, a population of, uh, of 200,000 people in susceptible, 200,000, and there's going to be 470 people infected, okay? I've chosen that so we can illustrate some dynamics. Okay, next, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to drag in a dynamic variable. And this will be called force of infection. Okay, this is going to be a, a hazard rate. It's going to be a chance per unit time, a probability per unit time, that people are going to get infected. Okay, now... <coughs> I have my notes uh, in front of me, um, and uh, I'm going to, I, I realize that it'll be actually more helpful if we do change the, um, uh, change the, the, the uh, time unit. So I'd like to go back to the model itself, and I would like to change this model time unit to be hours, okay, hours instead of uh, instead of weeks, okay? Now, let me ask this. Is changing the time unit likely to change the model performance dramatically? Yeah. No. This is just a yardstick by which we measured time, okay? Um, this, is a, this is a yardstick, and it just says, what does one mean? Is it one day, one week, one uh, hour, or what have you? We're going to change this force of infection. For now, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to make it 1% one, 1 per hour. Okay? Okay. Very good. Okay. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, I would like uh, to also, so it's 1%. What else do we need to do to make new infections plausible? Right now, it depends on force of infection, which is going to be a probability per hour of getting infected. What else do we need to do? To make Yeah, you have to link in the pool of susceptible people. Right? And why is that? Because if there ain't no susceptibles, there's nobody who's going to get infected. Okay? So I just did that. Notice when you grab things, you can you you know, select something, you can move around its label. So new infections is going to depend not only on susceptible, uh, not only on force of infection, but susceptible. So I'm going to say force of infection times susceptible. Okay, there we go. Uh, question, yeah. What is the difference between dynamic variable and parameter? It's a good question. Um, so uh, a dynamic variable is something that's actually endogenously calculated as part of the model. So um, I misspelled susceptible incidentally. Um, it's, it's, it's gonna be calculated on an ongoing basis by the model. So it's gonna be recalculated uh, whenever the stocks change. The, this will change and in general this 
dynamic variable is going to depend on the state of the system. So it's going to depend on the values of the stocks in this case. By contrast, a parameter is an assumption we make and typically it will stay fixed after its initial value is established. Okay? Now a parameter serves an additional role. It not only encodes that assumption, but it communicates that assumption from the point of creation to where it's actually used. And point of creation of main is in the experiment. So a parameter would actually allow us to tell, tell um, main what to assume. Okay? So a, a parameter encodes an assumption, commu helps communicate that assumption from the point of creation to the thing being that contains the parameter. By contrast, a dynamic variable is something that will be computed on an ongoing basis. We won't have to tell it explicitly to recompute. Okay? Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, suppose we were to run this. What would we see over time? What, suppose we were to draw out susceptible over time. What, what would we see? Anyone? Sorry? It would deplete. And would it be going down linearly or? Okay, initially it looks pretty linear. How if we ran it far enough? Curved indeed. And why curved? Why does it get curved? Well, uh huh. <coughs> exactly. Yeah. There's a certain fraction of susceptible that every time are 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 getting getting infected here. And so susceptible is being drawn down. When there's zero people left here, there's zero going out. When there's half the original number, half the number going out per per hour here as with the full population. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is a linear or nonlinear relationship. This is linear. This right now, this is this is a simple constant. So it's completely analogous, analogous to that. Right now, that's a linear relationship. We haven't introduced nonlinearity yet. Okay, fair enough. Um, let's go. Ladies and gentlemen, let's go uh, do something um, that will aid us in our investigations. Okay, one thing is we can drag up a time plot and we will call this time plot um, stocks time plot. Okay, I like to have a description of what it is so I could see it easily in a list, know what it is, but if you don't want to do that, that's fine. Um, in terms of data items, ladies and gentlemen, um, I would like to go here and uh, uh, I would like to put susceptible and we're gonna place this dot susceptible. Yes, you can omit this if you, if you uh, would like to do so and you're confident of what of how to how to manipulate Java in this way, uh, infective, and we have this dot infective. Okay, great. And now we need to go frob some settings below. So we set up to use values, and we're going to go frob some settings below. Uh, we do want it to update data automatically. We'll have it do every hour, but we want to display up to the latest latest. Um, 2,000 samples, and the time window will correspondingly be 2,000 time units. Okay, so that's just for the time plot. How many data points does it have in it, and over what time frame? Next, so that's for the time plot. For the simulation itself, I would like it to run to stop at specified time and guess what that time will be? 2000 indeed. Now ladies and gentlemen, there was something that troubled us the first day. You'll notice that I'm completely ignoring it, this randomness here. Why aren't, what, what lies beneath my nonchalance to that? Why am I not caring about that? There ain't no randomness in this model. This model is completely deterministic. 
And so it is with most system dynamics models. They tend to be deterministic. They're characterized most traditionally, not without exception, by ordinary differential equations, and those are deterministic, okay? They're sometimes called mean field approximations um, to stochastic systems, and we'll come back to that point, okay? So let's, let's go run this, and here we should see our counts, and what we see over time is, is what? What are we seeing here? What, what's going on? Stabilized. Stabilized, yeah. The susceptible population started at 200,000 and then it went down to close to zero and, and this one went up close to 200,000. Okay? Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, okay, let's, let's deal with the aesthetic displeasure, displeasurability of that. I'm going to sort of frob this so I could see the entire, the entire sort of scope of those labels. Okay? Great. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, we're working forward. And what I'd like to do now is to go and add in a stock here. Another stock. And this one will be called recovered. Recovered. Okay? And here we go. We set a flow here. And I'm going to call it recovery. Okay? Recovery. And ladies and gentlemen, we are going to go get this guy so he's he's connected there okay let's go add that stock into our chart so we could see all three okay and I'm going to say recovered okay and we're going to say this dot recovered okay you may be feeling pretty confident in your understanding now um, we are going to add in a simple uh, delay here, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we're going to add in a recovery delay that's going to be temporary, as we'll see, as a dynamic variable, and it's going to be called duration of infection. And it is going to be it is going to be 36 hours, okay? 36.0 hours. And I would like to, there to be another first order delay with duration of infection. You notice force of infection was the chance per unit time of getting infected. Duration of infection, what is that going to be? It's gonna be a first order delay, but what's the formula for this gonna be for recovery? Remember the units, if infectives are counted in people, what do the units for recovery have to be? People per hour. So what is, the what, do, what is the formula got to be for this? Duration of infection is in hours. So what is, what is the formula for recovery have to be? Infective divided by duration of infection. Great, okay, ladies and gentlemen. Great, excellent. Okay, we're, we're, we're just on a trip down memory lane right now. Make sure your thing here has recovery in it. And then we're gonna take this in a radically different direction in a couple of ways. Okay, next I want you to run this thing and just see the results. What do you think will happen now that we have these three stocks? Hmm? As we run it out, what will happen? Will the number of infectives just grow without limit and, and go, or will it go down? No. What are we seeing here? The colors are not very distinctive and we should update them. But what are we seeing? Let's try this again. I'm gonna change this to be different colors so they're, they are, they're not, so one's goldenrod, <laughs> Two are goldenrod and one is chocolate. I think we could do better than that. 
How about how about let's make uh, infective <coughs> red and susceptible green and recovered gray. What do you think? This is silver. This is gray. There we go. I want it to be very visible. Okay. So red for infective, green for susceptible, gray for recovered. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, what do you expect to see? Hmm? What do you expect to see? So can anyone explain what's going on? Good. Good. Okay, so infective starts going up. Why do they start going up initially? Large reservoir is susceptible. So that starts coming in here. Why does infective eventually plateau? Why does it, for, for this little bit of time, why is it neither going up or down? What must be the case if it's neither going up or down? Well, what must be the case, let, let's step back. What must be the case as it's rising? For it to rise, the stock of infectives to rise, what must be the case? Inflow is greater than the outflow. So inflow is infections per week, outflow is recovery per week. So more new infections are occurring than recovery. When it flattens out, what does that mean? Yeah, it's an equilibrium. And, and so what equals what? Inquil equals outflow. And then after this, what's going on? The yeah, the outflow is good. So the recovery in terms of people per week is greater than the new infections in terms of people per week. OK. Meanwhile, recovered is going up, right? and susceptible is going down. And that explains a lot of the dynamics. The susceptible dropping means there's fewer and fewer people coming into infective and increasingly there's people leaving infective and therefore it's drawn down. Do you see that? Does that make sense? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's continue on. Let's press onwards. Okay, now I'd like to do something which I've asked you to do in your problem set, in your assignment. By the way, this, this lecture will be critical for the final problem on that assignment. So those who are pursuing assignments, make a note. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna go to the analysis palette and we're gonna drag in a new type of plot. In this plot, it's gonna be what's variously called a state space plot or a phase plot, okay? And this is going to be called state, I'll call it state space plot. Ladies and gentlemen, the name reflects the fact that we're going to be plotting out the state in terms of x and y coordinates. So each, if we consider the, the sim simulation at a given point in time, it's going to have a certain value of susceptible and a certain value of, of effective. And we're going to use that to plot out the state. The state will be visualized as a point. And over time, its state will evolve. So let's create, add data in. We're going to add in, so this is a, a plot here, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to add in the state of the system. The x value will be given by this dot susceptible, and the y value by no less than this dot infected. Okay? Great. That's good. Let's, let's run it as it is. So what did I do? In case you missed that. I dragged in, not a time plot, but a plot. And, and I created, I called it state space plot, and I gave it a title, state. And the x-axis value is susceptible, and the y-axis value is recovered, is, is infective, rather. Okay, build, build early, build often. And let's run. So, let's get this right. At, a, at each point in time, the system we represented by a dot, its x location is going to be determined by the number susceptible, and its y location by the number infected. So what do you expect, if you think about what this system is doing now, what do you expect it to do on the state space plot? First of all, what would a trajectory look like on the state space plot? What would happen on the state space plot? As the as the system evolves. So in that other plot, we had a time plot, and over time, you know, it was it was exhibiting behavior or what have you. What is it going to look like on the state space plot? So where's it gonna start? If this is susceptible, 
and this is infective, and this is the cone of people, where is it going to start? Far to the right. Far to the right, and lower right or upper right? Yeah, uh, zero. yeah it's down here, right? There's 470 infectives, or it's something like 200,000, these guys, right? And then what's going to happen over time? Okay, up to the left. So the number of susceptibles will be dropping, hence moving, will be moving this way to the left. And the number of infectives will be going, at least initially, will be going, the number of infectives will go down? Will go up, okay. And then what? Eventually, does it go up without limit? No. What will happen eventually? It drop. drop, okay. And the number of susceptibles, does it start getting more susceptibles again? No. Okay, so it's going to go down. And so, something like, okay. It's kind of hard to do in our head, isn't it? It's a diff the point that I want to emphasize is it's a different way of conceptualizing what's the behavior of the system. We have one thing that's behavior, behavior over time, and, and maybe that's a more intuitive notion. Here we have state space behavior, ladies and gentlemen. Now, probably we should have set the axes of this because you could see it's kind of dynamically reaxisifying. Um, it's changing the, the axis. Oh, look at that. Oh, it's... Okay, we have a, a, a descending snake. Um, that isn't quite what we wanted. Um, okay, uh, that's not so useful. Let's go back and frob the setting, shall we not? L let's engage in frobbing behavior. So, so if you go up to main and you click on this, um, let's go and we'll, we'll change a couple things. The first thing is for the data update, we'll display how many samples? 2,000 uh, 2, actually, 2,000. <laughs> Okay, um, and it'll be updating every one time, fair enough. Um, the scale of it, ladies and gentlemen, let's set it to be fixed. So it'll be fixed, and the horizontal scale will go from zero to 200,000. After all, that's roughly, uh, call it 200,470, because after all, we had four that many people in the population. And the vertical scale, ladies and gentlemen, will be the same, the same span, okay? This is the entire population size. Are we ready to, to try this? Yes, good question. Okay, and ladies and gentlemen, let's, let's also adjust as we did below. Let's adjust this to give us requisite size here, okay? Okay, are we okay with this? Ladies and gentlemen, Build early, build often, right. run the model. So what's going to go on? Now we're going to see the big picture. What's going to happen? What's going to happen? This is also, ladies and gentlemen, called a phase plot. Phase plot, OK? This is a depiction at the bottom of system behavior over time, this is a depiction of system behavior in state space. And you could see that x-axis is one aspect of state, the y-axis is another aspect of state. Time is kind of implicit in this. It's kind of parameterized by time. It's, it, it time plays out over here. State, spaces, state space plots are going to be very useful for the three types of modeling we're talking about. We're going to use them particularly for agent-based and system dynamics models. Agent-based are going to be summaries of the state of the system over many agents. Even here, how many dimensions of space, of, of, of how many aspects of state do we have? Well, you might be tempted to say three, but there's really two because the other is just the total, the total population size is constant. So the other one can just be determined by the total population size minus the sum of the other two. There's really two, and we've depicted it here. As the number of state variables gets larger, we're depicting projections down into two dimensions. But does this make sense? What's going on? Yeah. Yes? Only looking at the state plot. 
Yeah? We don't know how it actually evolved. Correct. Correct. There are versions of the state plot that I may show you where an arrow is drawn, which actually shows the direction. And in fact, there's very nice depictions, which some of the graduate students will explore in this class, uh, in some of the packages for mathematical analysis, which will draw little lines on the state space, which show if you were to put the system in this state, where would it evolve next? It kind of shows flow lines. So you could think of the system here as like a, a leaf you drop into a, or you know, pe little piece of wood you drop into a stream, and it will swirl around. And depending where you drop it, it will go in a fairly well-defined way, okay? So here we started here, and it went here, but if we had started up here, it would have led it to a somewhat different outcome. And in fact, there's augmented versions of this that will show little lines that indicate how it evolves. And those lines are derived from the underlying differential equations. If you're in this location and configure that the x and y dx dy, and it can show a little line that indicate size of the dx, the size of the dy pointing in the appropriate way. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, so we see some interesting things there. Um, we could play around with this, but, but you know, we've been, we've been rehashing some basic concepts and we still haven't seen nonlinearity. So ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce some nonlinearity. Okay, so what I'd like to do here um, is to, and maybe per my notes about what would be better, maybe what I will do is add one final flow, which remains linear before we start we start putting some additional, uh, I, 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 will, I will contravene my notes, sorry. Um, I wanna do something different. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. So what I wanna do here is I would like to put in place a couple features. So I'm gonna give this guy some space. Whoa, no, I didn't wanna do that. I wanna give him some space above him so I can drag it around or her. There we are, boom, there, there, there it is. Um, so I just selected it and I drag it with my arrow keys, okay? I'm gonna give it a little bit of space and I'm gonna put in place some mechanisms. The first thing is I'm gonna put in place a dynamic variable, which you could argue is not needed in this case, although I would argue if we start to, to modify the model in certain ways, it will be. And it's called total population. Ladies and gentlemen, if I gave a formula for the total population, what would that formula have to involve of necessity? Mm -hmm. uh, the three stocks. The three stocks, excellent. I, I, I heard Jesse's voice. Okay, great. Okay. Okay, here we go. There we go. So total population is, now the tradition here is you just write these without uh, uh, offending this. So susceptible plus infective plus what? Indeed, indeed. So here we have all three of those. We're gonna have a total population, build early, build often. Build there, okay? Next, using reasoning that will be more fully explicating during our next session, but we, which we don't have time to, to fully discuss today, I'm gonna drag down something that's going to be a dynamic variable and it's called, ladies and gentlemen, it's called fractional prevalence, that means what fraction of the population is infective? On what will this depend? Okay, it would depend partly on, on total population. And if we're considering prevalence as the prevalence of infection in the population, on what else will it depend? Mm -hmm. What else besides total population? Infective indeed. So I'm gonna drag this down here. Now you'll notice that these models, these system dynamics models, uh, have a lot to say for them in terms of 
the high level visual tells you a lot about what depends on what. It, it highlights it as certain structural features of the situation, even while many of the details, like the details of the formulae, remain hidden. So for fractional prevalence, what would I put in? You got it. Good. Great. Okay, now, now, ladies and gentlemen, comes a, a formula that we're going to decompose into pieces, okay? And before I, before I do that, I'm going to put in a parameter. And this parameter is going to be mean contacts per hour, okay, for someone in the population. Okay. And ladies and gentlemen, we're going to drag in a dynamic variable here that's going to be mean infectious contacts per hour. And that's going to be an, an estimate. That's not something, that's a dynamic variable. It's not a parameter. And, oh, okay, I got, I got, I did a bad thing there. We're going to, what would that depend on? If, if, if we consider, okay, we have some number of mean contacts per hour. Let's suppose we're dealing with the flu and I have contacts with 10 people per hour total. Um, and suppose there was a force of infection, uh, uh, excuse me, suppose there was a, were a fractional prevalence a fractional prevalence here of 50%. On average, how many people would I bump into per hour who are infectious? If a total contact with 10 people per hour, and out there in the population, about 50% of people are infectious. How many people would you wager I, I bump into per hour that are infectious? 50. 50%, 50 so five of those 10. Okay, so we're going to have mean infectious contacts per hour just depend on fractional prevalence time mean contacts per hour, okay? Okay, now we're on the cusp, ladies and gentlemen, of greatness. Okay, we're on the cusp of greatness. And we're gonna put in a time-honored approximation to, to bring us into, into a state where we're going to begin experimenting again to complete this sort of thought. And what we're going to have there is a parameter per, per um, and I, I'm tempted to use different words, per, um, uh, so I'm gonna say transmission probability. I'll just say that, transmission probability, okay? So if an infective meets a susceptible, what's the chance that they will transmit to that, to that susceptible, if, if there's a contact that takes place? And ladies and gentlemen, this is gonna impact the force of infection, the chance per contact of infection, and then for mean infectious contacts per hour, that's gonna infect it or affect the force of infection. So ladies and gentlemen, the force of infection here is going to be transmission probably, excuse me, it's gonna be mean infectious contacts per hour times transmission probability. So that is an approximation. Can anyone say why that's an approximation? Suppose there's each of your contacts with an infective, you're susceptible, each of your contacts with an infective has a 1% chance of transmitting it to you. Why do I say, and you have five contacts on average per hour, why do I say it's an approximation to say that's 5%, five times 0 0.01? Well, well, ladies and gentlemen, not all of them are independent. I can only get infected by the second one if I didn't get infected by the first. 
I can only get affected by the third one if I didn't get affected by the first two. So it turns out that there's a more there's a more correct. And so if we consider, suppose there's a probability that I get affected from one contact. What's the probability that I I stay uninfected? Can anyone tell me? After one contact, if the probability is p that I get infected, what's the probability I stay uninfected after one contact? One minus p. One minus p. Good. And I would argue the only way, the only way I'm going to stay uninfected after n contacts, five contacts, say, is if I stay uninfected from each and every one of them. Okay? I remain uninfected from the first, then I'm uninfected from the second, and I'm uninfected from the third. And the probability of that happening, if we consider each of them as independent in terms of uh, probability of infecting is 1 minus p to the n. That's the probability, ladies and gentlemen. This is the probability that I remain uninfected. So the probability that I've been infected by after n contacts is actually 1 minus this. Now, if p is small here, you can, you can consider this. It's actually very close to n times p. If, if n p is, is fairly small, it's a pretty good approximation to this. You can do Taylor series expansion, and, and it's very close to it. So approximate this. And that's the, that is the approximation we've used here. This, the force of infection, the chance that I get infected is the number of contacts I have per hour. The chance I get infected per hour is the number of contacts I have per hour times the probability each of them will transmit infection to me. OK. So ladies and gentlemen. What we've just put in may seem a bit involved. We'll talk more about it next time. But I'd like to run the model and see the effects. How do you think this? Yes, what Alex. The values and the thank you. Thank you. OK, so uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, so transmission probability is 1%, 0 0.01. Mean contacts per hour is 12. Each person in the in the population has that has that many contacts per hour on average. Are we ready? Let's run this thing. Let's build. And now, ladies and gentlemen, let us run. How do you think this will change things? I should have asked. How do you think it will change things? What 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 was this force of infection? It was just a, a, a fixed value. What is it now? What does it depend on now? If we trace back all these lengths, what does it depend on? Okay, yeah, so it depends on those, but what else does it depend on? So, so yes, it depends on this, and this depends on that. What else? Prevalence, which depends on? Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, now, if one person gets infected, a second person's more likely to, well, okay, so if it starts with one person infected and then a second person gets infected, the remaining susceptibles are now more likely to get infected. So it may go from one initial person infected to two, to four, to eight, and each time the susceptibles are around are surrounded by more and more infected people, right? Think about it. So what's going to happen now? as that runs out. How do you think that will change things from before? How did that change things, ladies and gentlemen? What happened? What's different? First of all, did all the susceptibles, so, so broadly what's happened? Broadly, what's that? Where at the beginning, almost everyone was susceptible. Where are they at the end? They're in recovery, right? What happened in between? Well, clearly the number of susceptibles dropped, but what else happened? Okay, did it go above the value it used to have with that 1%? Yeah, now it's this chance, ladies and gentlemen, 
the number that actually get infected, it, is, it actually gets to a much higher peak. Now it also is, it also, you know, it's fairly sharp peak. It isn't dragging out for, for too, too long. And then it goes down to zero. Now does everyone get infected? Do susceptibles go to zero? Before, did susceptible get very, very close to zero? Yes, if we had looked at it, it would have been down to about 10 to the minus four. So about one out of 10,000 joules at the end of this time, and it would have become small and smaller. Excuse me, here, has everyone become uninfected? Or become, uh, all the susceptibles gone? Let's go up and look. No, there's about 2,800 of them remaining. Do you see them? Do you see that? 2,800, ladies and gentlemen. What happened to them? I want you to puzzle over that for next time. How is it that some of them remained uninfected? Okay, let's, let's uh, play around with this a bit. And then we're gonna have a, a, a crescendo of, of, of uh, experimentation. Okay, so I'd like you to copy this experiment and I'd like you to paste it. Here we go, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like you to paste it down. So how did I do that? I right clicked here, I did copy, and then I did paste. Good or not? <laughs> Good. Um, okay, so ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to say here um, instead, uh, we, had, uh, we had a, uh, okay, I'm, I'm doing, uh, some, okay, so we're going to say high, high transmissibility. High transmissibility. Okay, we're gonna change transmission probability, ladies and gentlemen, from 0.01 to, oh, to 0.05. Okay, sorry, ladies and gentlemen, you can ignore what's going on on my screen. Um, okay, to, to 0.05. And uh, I would like you to run that now, okay? And I'd like you to comment on the results. High transmissibility. The probability of transmission when you have a contact between a susceptible on the one hand and an infective on the other is 5%, 0 0.05. What happens? What do you see different? There's, there's fewer susceptibles left over? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, okay. And, and what happens to the number of infectives? It spikes at over Wow. Okay. So, so ladies and gentlemen, okay. Um, uh, so, do, 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 do. Um, here we are. Uh, it, it goes up to 150,000. Okay. That's great. Um, uh, uh, that's good, and uh, um, okay, now I'd like you to change these parameters instead, ladies and gentlemen, um, so that we have, um, uh, we, we instead set um, the uh, recovery delay, set recovery delay here uh, to three days instead of four day, instead of 12 days, okay? So create another experiment. How do we do that? We do, again, we right click this and then we paste it in and it should be called fast recovery, okay? Okay, here we go. Hi, transmissibility. I'm, I'm trying to catch up with you folks. And there we go, okay? And I will run it. This new one, um, it's gonna have the standard values Oh, look at that. We had duration of infection. Oh man, it was based, we didn't base it on a parameter. So we're not gonna be able to change that. So in light of the time, I'm going to make an alternative request. So this is, uh, this, uh, you know, indicates Alex, the comments on Alex's correctness. So for this new one, instead of calling short infection, I'll call it um, uh, reduced contacts, okay? Reduce contacts. Maybe schools are closed. Maybe, maybe um, there's uh, there's an advisory put out which gets people to change uh, behavior in some substantive way. 
uh, maybe the public transit system is, is shut down and, and uh, businesses are urged to allow people to work at home. Um, this is going to be low contacts and we're going to reduce contacts per hour to three from 12. And I'd like you to, to let me know what happens, okay? So here we go. Um, I'm going to copy uh, this over here, paste, and this is going to be called, this is gonna be called uh, uh, low uh, or reduced contact, reduced contact. There we go. And we're reducing it from 12 to 3.0. Okay, what's going to happen now when we run this? So what's happening? It's a much lower rate of infection. Indeed, indeed. Much, much lower. And, it, and in fact, it plays out much more slowly, right? Much more slowly. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to make one final suggestion here. Okay. Um, and there we, we say uh, copy reduced contact and call it minimal contact. Okay. Minimal contact minimal contact and here the contacts per hour will be reduced uh, yet further okay reduced down to one per hour okay one per hour and I'd like you to run that and tell me what happens What has happened, ladies and gentlemen? Yeah, so they're quite different. And in fact, what you'll see is that the number susceptible here is, is almost all of the population. And if you look at the number infective here, ladies and gentlemen, um, and you, you, you start at, and I'm, I'm, I'm focusing on this, this earlier time, you find that very quickly, it's actually dropping. It's, it's dropping down. And, and I'm going to turn this off from, from full speed mode. But you see, it, it drops down almost immediately. I don't know if you could see that. I'll, I, I, I'll, put it, I'll slow it down even further. I'll run it at normal speed. Okay, I'm using this here. I'm going to, to stop it. It's at normal speed. Um, and you'll notice it's just dropping, dropping, dropping. Are people getting infected at all? Yeah, very small numbers. Very, small numbers, very, very small numbers. The point is the infection is dying out in the population. Yes, a few people get infected, but the number of infectives is just dying down, dying down. It started at 470, and you could see by hour 25, it's just dropping, dropping dramatically. It's, it's, it's dropping down, okay? Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, here we have a situation where the infection's not really getting established. It is sort of vacating the population. What do we see up here in the state? We haven't really been, been looking at the state-based ramifications. Well, the state-based ramifications are what? It starts here, and then what happens? Essentially stays there. It doesn't really go anywhere. There's not really an increase in the number of infective, not really a decrease in the number of susceptible. By contrast, if we look at high transmissibility case, and we were to look at the state space up here, this is what we will see. Where is it? Well, it went down here, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, there we go. Okay. Time is, is short, ladies and gentlemen. 
I would like you to puzzle over. You have your problem sets to work on, but I have one request to, for you. Um, I would like you to puzzle over why is it that not all of the population got infected? Even in that run where a large fraction of them did, even in this high transmissibility run, there's going to be some residual people who are not infected. It's very small in this case. Uh, in the case, the baseline case, the case with sort of standard parameters, we're going to have actually uh, about 2,800 people remaining. Why is it that they didn't get infected? Um, if we ran it out longer, would they all get infected? I want you to puzzle these things out. I want to also ask, where is the nonlinearity in this model? You could easily verify that as you increase the transmission probability, you change the mean contacts per hour, things don't change in a linear fashion. Indeed, we just saw as we lower the mean contacts per hour, we can actually dramatically change the situation. At, at, at one point, the, the infection just dies out. At other points, it takes off really high. At other points, it takes off uh, in a very slow manner. Two very different outcomes, though, dying out versus taking off. So I'd like to ask you, I'd like to pose to you why. Why? Where is the nonlinearity that underlies that? Where is the where is the feature of this model that makes it nonlinear? I'd like you to think about that as well. Okay? So um, this model that we built today has the key features needed for the final problem on that assignment. Next time we will be going through some of these issues I've just I've just riddled you with and with which I've just riddled you. And then we will be um, continuing on to discussion of, of some additional features of this population, um, including open populations and, and sort of recycling when we can have not just uh, one sweep through the population in an outbreak, but several. Okay? As normal, I will have office hours after this uh, over in uh, 341 or 2, I forget which one it is, but over there, and I'd be glad to, uh, to meet with students. Thank you very much.